Welcome back to another episode of the Food for Thought podcast. I'm your host, Erin Hallstrom. Today's episode marks the end of our third season of the Food for Thought podcast. And before I introduce our guest for today, on behalf of the entire food processing team, we want to say thank you for being a listener. Don't forget to rate us and leave a review. We'll be on hiatus for the next month, but we'll be back with more great guests on Season 4, starting in January. Joining me today is Maggie Slowick, Global Industry Director for Manufacturing at IFS. We're talking about two topics that all food and beverage manufacturers have to contend with, whether they like it or not, food safety and consumer trust. In this episode, Maggie walks us through how food safety and consumer trust are related. We talk about what trends she's seeing, as well as what's at stake if a manufacturer doesn't have good end-to-end quality management practices in place. We then spend some time talking about how food safety and traceability can lend themselves as opportunities for competitive differentiation. We dig into the current consumer mindset while also talking about the best practices of several food companies that have married transparency with consumer trust. We end the episode with a discussion about technology's role in all of this, as well as how IFS can help processors remain compliant with regulatory requirements while also building that consumer trust. Enjoy the episode! Welcome back to the Food for Thought podcast. Let's jump right in. This question may seem obvious, but why is food safety so important? And quick follow-up to that, what constitutes good practice? I'm very curious. Hi, Erin, and thank you so much for having me back on your podcast today. Can I answer in a very blunt way to you to just to set the scene on this topic? Food safety is absolutely critical because it's essentially the license to operate for any food and beverage manufacturer. The industry, as as we know it, is is very heavily regulated around the world. And and what this means is that food safety is driven by the establishment of well-documented procedures, including who exactly touched each material or critical process. But regardless of size or product, all food producers have a responsibility to manage the safety of their products and uh, the well-being of their consumers, on top, of course, of meeting the standards of the retailers that they work with. Because at the end of the day, it's about securing the shelf space in retail, right? So as far as regulations are concerned, in, in the U.S., for instance, we know that the FDA's food safety and Modernization Act lays down general principles, requirements, and procedures that really underpin decision-making in matters of food as well as feed safety. And interestingly enough, I think that the act, which was signed into law about 10 plus years ago, it, it's transforming the nation's food safety sim- system by, by shifting the focus from what I would call responding to foodborne illness to preventing it. And this predictive, this predictive and preventive approach is, is really crucial nowadays. And, and I'll come to that later because the industry is really challenged by a lot of um, factors at the moment. And of course, I could go on about other regulations as well. In Europe, for instance, you have the general food law regulation, which provides an overarching framework for the development of food and feed legislation, both at union as well as national levels. But the point I think about regulation is that they differ based on the region and locality you operate in, and of course the sub-industry that you're focused on as a manufacturer. And all of that makes the issue of compliance really complex, especially given how large food manufacturing supply chains tend to be. And on the topic of regulations, you can also seek out certain certifications. There is, for instance, ISO 22000, which is an internationally recognized food safety management standard and quality certification that applies to any organization that participates in food production directly or or indirectly. And the other thing to keep in mind is that 
these regulations are constantly changing. So it's a monumental task for food and beverage manufacturer to stay on top of these regulations, to, to stay updated, because at the end of the day, it also comes down to customer trust. And I will go into that uh, in just a little bit. Coming on to the second part of your question, Erin, um, what constitutes good practice? Well, of course, you need to maintain certain quality standards in the way you handle and process food in your factory, as um, they are dictated by the various regulations and legal frameworks. But at the end of the day, what matters is that you have that end to end traceability and not just within your factory, but also across your entire value chain. So in the case of a foodborne illness outbreak or contamination event, manufacturers must have efficient upstream and downstream tracking capabilities to rapidly find the source, the exact source of the product and where the contamination may have occurred. And this enables faster removal of the affected product from the marketplace and it reduces incidences of foodborne illnesses. That is the aim, but the more ideal scenario is to, of course, prevent such contaminations before they even occur because, and you will hear me saying this throughout this post podcast, it really comes down to trust. And that is a key in a market that is incredibly competitive, where margins are razor thin. And now look at the situation that we're facing, increased supply chain complexity, as well as inflation, and that's just gonna get worse. So tell me, what new trends are you seeing? For starters, I will say that this is an incredibly dynamic industry. There are so many external influences, whether it's regulations, consumer preferences or other factors. The industry has to constantly adapt and reinvent itself. But if I were to highlight some recent trends that are impacting food safety, I would start with definitely consumer preference and demand. And, and the thing to highlight here is that consumers are changing their preferences quickly and, and constantly. It's never staying the same. Think about alternative forms of protein moving away from meat less sugar or, or changing to organic, uh, plant-based and, and, and sustainable ingredients. I mean, we know all of these things as we're going through, you know, our grocery stores, you constantly see new um, products popping up. And these are all the things that consumers are demanding. And not only does it put tremendous pressure on manufacturers to keep on innovating, but also we need to consider that when new food trends arise, new sets of food safety regulations and guidelines must also be released to ensure safety. And then manufacturers will have to think about putting the right um, quality processes in place. What also plays into that is the increase in healthier options, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic consumers have become even more conscious of their lifestyle choices. So we're going to see more of a proliferation in terms of um, in terms of demanding for for new um, and, and healthier products down the line. And that's, as I mentioned, is posing certain challenges in terms of meeting um, testing and, and quality requirements. And another trend that is on the rise is sustainability. So the, the industry is responding to its environmental responsibility across the value chain, spanning across production, agriculture, the use of more natural and sustainable resources, all the way to more efficient ways of manufacturing and transport, and then down to consumer levels, including composting, packaging, recycling, and, and many other practices. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the consumer owners in all of this um, later on. I would also, and I think this is really fascinating because it's, it's an area that's grown incredibly fast, I would highlight social media as, as yet another trend because in the age of Twitter and Instagram, information travels incredibly fast. And the acti activity of social personalities reaches customers within just a few clicks. So food businesses often use this avenue for marketing, but at the same time, consumers and influencers can use these types of platforms to patronize brands and products once they've had a bad experience. Just, just a single bad experience will, um, will influence and people becoming more vocal on these, on these platforms. 
And another trend, just thinking about this, but more from a technology angle, is the increase in automation of production, especially in light of uh, a winding labor force that's really happening across the, the entire world at the moment. And one example of automation is installing, for instance, AI-enabled sensors that detect food defects based on pre-uploaded information. And this innovation is often used to speed up quality inspection during the receiving of, of raw materials, but can also be um, applied to other use cases as well. So I guess I would say that overall, the, the automation of processes um, have been proven to reduce the likelihood of errors, which can be a common case in, in the human workforce, as we know. And, and we're also at a point today where automation technologies and sensors have become much more affordable than they used to be. So I, I personally um, expect an uptake in, in more of these types of technologies. And what's at stake if this isn't done well? If, if a manufacturer does not have good, I talked about this before, end-to-end um, -end quality management practices in place, we are looking at potential cases of um, all sorts of things. I'm just going to list a few of those. Food poisoning, um, food spoilage, food contamination, allergic reactions, worse even, um, prosecution for contravention of food safety legislation, and potentially the closure of manufacturing facilities. Um, however, the cost associated with poor safety, with poor food safety, can be a mix of financial, social, and, and also, and that's the worst of all, a reputational nature, or it could be a combination of all of the above. And if I were to list some financial costs, I mean, they're, they're the more obvious candidates. We're talking about factory downtime associated with investigations, decontamination, the cleaning and the replacement of equipment. That is, um, you know, an, an, un, uh, an underestimated cost sometimes for manufacturers. And then there's also the administrative costs associated with processing recalls and investigations, informing the media in case it comes to recall, uh, damage compensation to retailers as well as to end consumers, and then, of course, stock recovery. And this is really a, a mix of both financial as well as social costs. But I think... The worst of all of these scenarios is reputational cost. Um, in, in, in case it ever comes to recall or some sort of media scandal, and we, we all can think of, you know, at least one or two um, sort of recall incidents that have, you know, made, made big headlines. And, and that, that's not good, really. It puts off um, uh, consumers and, and certainly doesn't um, make retailers happy by any means. The bottom line is much of the food industry really rests on trust. And so a sense of safety and security has to be present if a consumer is willing to trial any, any manufacturer's product. And as I said before, food and beverage companies do want to get that shelf space in grocery stores. So retailers actually have a lot of power in that market space as well. It's not just down to um, to consumers. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum now. What opportunities are there? So earlier on, I talked about the importance of traceability, and it's not just a matter of compliance with regulations, but I think also an opportunity for competitive differentiation. Um, might sound far-fetched, but actually it's not, um, because Having access to granular, real-time data of any details from sourcing to delivery in an extended way, potentially multi-site, multi-company, and multi-regional, manufacturers can demonstrate that they are viable and, and, and a trustworthy supplier and, and a trustworthy brand to their respective customer ecosystem. And, and that is what builds up to a more mature way of, of um, sort of a food safety assurance and, and traceability. So it's all about capitalizing on this data and, and, and uh, visibility and, and using it to build trust in the marketplace. And let's remind ourselves why, why this matters in terms of competitive differentiation. Uh, consumers today are way more knowledgeable and demanding about the foods that they purchase. And they have literally become information obsessed and, um, and, and they, they, they demand closer connection to, um, to the food brands that they, that they purchase. So what they want is more in-depth product information 
beyond what is already provided on the physical label. And there's actually research out there that shows that consumers are even willing to switch to another brand if they cannot get this kind of transparency with a product that they're already familiar with. So there's a lot of value in disclosing um, this data to, uh, to consumers. And I will give you an example. One of our customers at IFS is Gaia Herbs, a leading US-based herbal supplement brand focused on organic farming from soil to shelf. And, and Gaia Herbs has a traceability program called Meet Your Earth. So, so a consumer can go online and they can enter the ID number located on the back of any Gaia Herb product to view all of the traceable aspects of each herbal component of the product. And they can also explore each individual herb to learn more about the uses and the history and the function. So it's a little bit like taking a virtual walk on the Gaia Herbs farm. So it's really cool. So, so at the end of the day, consumers are increasingly buying into this type of information which is all enabled by good traceability, of course. Yeah, that definitely sounds very cool what you're talking about. So next question for you, what is the role of technology here? To what extent can companies take advantage of digital technology? I think technology will play a great role in this shift to help businesses get a better handle on efficiency, quality, and, and traceability. And, and really like, just, you know, we have already seen progress being made but i think it's it's you know as technology is advancing in terms of functionality coming down in terms of pricing companies adopting more and more of this technology i think we're going to see some some paradigm um, shift happening here even though i will also say that there are still a lot of manual processes in place including spreadsheets um there's really no way around not investing in digital technology um because it allows you to log and process massive amounts of transactions and product information. And it gives you that end-to-end -end traceability of the product's journey. And it all comes down to being able to access accurate, real-time information so you can act on it immediately if, if you needed to. That's incredibly powerful. So remember the trend is towards preventing problems as opposed to, to reacting to them. And this is where re the value of real-time data comes into. And, and also in, in the past years, if you look at um, digital transformation and you know companies investing in IoT technologies, that has really helped to revolutionize food supply chains with um, sensors collecting a lot of data and not only report on conditions, but uh, but also to enable decision making with, within organizations. And you know, let's just talk about a couple of examples here with with you know what I'm talking about in terms of um, IoT data collection. It could be anything from the temperature of the transportation truck to to the source of ingredients. All of it can now be recorded using IoT enabled devices, and also. Product quality can be monitored as soon as the item leaves the field or the factory or the warehouse, giving companies, again, real-time automated and intelligent insight. While it's great to have all of this information, at the end of the day, companies need a modern and flexible business software solution that is able to unify the data and, and the processes from, from different sources into one single database giving users a single source of truth you know nothing could be more frustrating than having data in, in siloed places knowing full well it's there but not being able to access it because it could be you know again spread across in different formats and so on and so forth so you really want to have that single source of truth and if your erp can accomplish this acting on the large volumes of data and providing actionable insights to your key stakeholders, then it is acting as a very strategic as a very strategic decision making tool. And, and that is exactly what companies should, should be aiming for when they're making technology investments and, and trying to really ensure that they're good at, um, at uh, traceability and, and, and quality performance. How exactly does IFS support its food and beverage customers to help them be compliant with key regulatory requirements and also build that customer trust? 
Sure. So, so first of all, we offer a what I would call a comprehensive um, and, and industry specific solution that supports all phases of the product life cycle. So it could be from new product development to, uh, to marketing and sales, procurement, manufacturing, and of course, uh, delivery to the customer. And one of our best kept secrets is the fact that we combine ERP with asset management and service capabilities. And this is all in one single database. And that makes us incredibly unique in the market as well. And what underpins all of these processes in quality management. We support customers with um, a range of things such as audits, non-conformance reporting, in-process controls, and, and all of the quality instructions really are part of the shop orders. And at the end of the day, we also support international standards, including the FDA. And on top of this, we do offer end-to-end -end traceability capabilities to our customers which allows them to not only maintain good quality standards across the entire value chain, but also trace their products both up as well as downstream. And, and that ability is incredibly powerful. But the main benefit um, that I would highlight here is the fact that we are a single system that really has everything. And it comes with open API, allowing our customers to easily integrate with other systems if they wish to, for instance, limb systems. So it's incredibly flexible as well as modular in that sense. And, you know, recently we have also built on our MES capabilities, allowing us to integrate with machines on the shop floor to collect real-time data um, that is critical to quality control. So we're making continuous investments to ensure that um, food and beverage customers who are a, a very part of our manufacturing customer base are able to meet um, the challenges uh, not only of today, but also of tomorrow. Before we jump off, can you tell me or talk to me about how food safety relates to driving sustainability? Let me just go back to what I mentioned earlier, and, and that is that the industry is facing pressures across a range of stakeholders, whether it's customers, investors, employees and regulators, and, and they are demanding more sustainable products and, and certainly um, production and, and processes. What is the operational implication of this? Well, companies must be able to explain and account for the journey that products and their associated raw materials have traveled through. So achieving this requires not only access to complete and good data, but also the effective management thereof. In that sense, traceability is not only an enabler of quality, but also of sustainability, if that makes sense. So those companies that have a mature approach to traceability should be able to provide a complete product history download to both customers as well as regulators and use this data to support with ESG reporting activities and, and goals overall. But sustainability does not stop with the food manufacturer per se. There is a lot that the industry can do to influence consumer behavior, especially when it comes to waste. And, um, and, I, and this is really a very fascinating topic, I think. Um, we're all are familiar with um, with the data labels printed on the food that we buy, right? So often we're seeing a use by or um, an expires on type of message in the back of the product. And of course, these messages are meant to provide useful information and advice about when a product is at its best. But you could also argue that not only do these labels fail to communicate meaningful communication to consumers, but they also, worse even, encourage consumers to throw, to throw out what might be still perfectly good food. And I, I don't know about you, but um, I often, at least in the past, have, have tended uh, to, to throw away uh, food just by looking at, at the label without actually checking the, the condition of, of the food. And um, it's just something that um, we need to raise more um, awareness um, around and consumer education. So the, the reality is that the date on these labels rarely indicates the, the actual food safety of a food product. Rather, they tend to reflect estimates on 
when it will be at its peak quality or taste its best. And, and this means that large volumes of food, of, of safe food, are being um, needlessly thrown away, you know, each, each year. And I want to talk, in this context, I want to talk about another customer of ours, and um, they're called Yo Valley, and, and Yo Valley is, is a UK-based manufacturer of all sorts of dairy products, um, organic dairy products, and they have decided to move from using use by to best before dates. And what this means is that their products are at their best before the state, but they can still be eaten and still taste good after the state. So the company puts the onus back to consumers, encouraging them to make what I would call common sense decisions by storing products in the right way, you know, making sure that they are um, always under the right temperature and, you know, ensuring that they smell them before they eat them. And, and that is sort of discouraging the, the way, the, the, the sort of way society that, that we live in. And I think we need to see more of this type of consumer education going forward. And again, there's a lot that the industry, that the food and beverage industry can influence. And actually, just as I'm saying this, um, I just remembered that in the UK, um, there's, a, there's a big retailer brand here called Sainsbury's. And back in August, they have begun um, removing best before dates from over 100 of their fresh lines, including uh, items like pears, onions, to, um, tomatoes, and, and citrus fruit. And I know this might seem um, strange to some of us, but consumers can use common sense uh, and, and certainly contribute towards the, the decrease of waste and, and really achieve a lot of impact from that perspective. So I think we are sort of heading into a very interesting direction. And it, uh, you know, it just highlights the fact that uh, not all onus is on the industry, but also on consumers and customers, but they require a certain level of um, encouragement, um, nudging, um, whatever you might call it. And uh, it must be in that sense, a sort of collaborative effort. Well, Maggie, yet again, you've delivered such great information for our audience to consider. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Food for Thought podcast. Thank you, Erin. everyone listening to the Food for Thought podcast today, thank you for tuning in. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and just about everywhere you can listen to a podcast. Be sure to tune in next time as we talk more about the stories behind the headlines of the food and beverage industry. Take care. Have a great day.